Yes, I know my hair looks estate, but I don't have any hot water currently in my flat. And if you think I'm washing my hair in cold water, you are mistaken, my friends. So I'm just going to distract you by a festive jumper. I have mistletoe on my tits. Isn't this what you came back for? Anyway, I'm going to try and do this as quickly as I can because I know this video will wrap up is really overdue. And so, hello everyone! I'm Jenny, welcome back to my channel. <laughs> and I would like to do this straight through as much as possible because I know I haven't filmed for a long time again and I would like to not have to edit too much so I can just get this on, whack it on YouTube. So, I read 11 books that were Victorian in October, which is not many. I had kind of a reading slump, which is sad, but it's okay. I pretty much enjoyed all the books that I read. So I just want to quickly say, that was not smooth, that I reread Jane Eyre and The Picture Dorian Gray, both five star reads, incredible, actually possibly even better the second time around, but I'm not going to talk about those because I feel like everyone has heard about them and other people have read them and talked about them, so I'm going to talk about the other ones that I read. So, where's the pile? There we go. First one is The Middle of a Floss by George Eliot. This was a five star read possibly a book of the year not a favorite but like why not my favorites it was just incredible i haven't read a george Eliot in such a long time this is only the third novel that i've read by her and it's about maggie and her brother tom but maggie is a protagonist here and she's a lot more intelligent than her brother she has qualities that are not particularly aspired to in victorian times for women so there's a lot of interesting points about the disparity in education because her brother Tom, despite not being as clever as her, is still given a formal education because her father thinks that that is more worthwhile than teaching him to take over their mill. And the floss is actually a river. I didn't know that. I never heard a river being called that before. But it is about Maggie growing up and her befriending of one of Tom's schoolfellows and he's a he's a really lovely character Philip and I I really wanted more of him in the book but it's oh, I, it's hard to talk about without spoiling it too much but it's a lot about repressed passions and love and not feeling like you can express yourself especially Maggie like, as a woman because she's so emotionally dependent on Tom and the ending is so beautifully written I had feelings, I had all the feelings after finishing this book and I had this urgency to finish it. It is such a great read and, and if you like Elliot and you haven't read this one yet, I will implore you to read it. I know not everyone likes it but I loved it a million percent. That was not a very good explanation of it but I loved it, just read it. Okay, and moving on. This is Dracula which I wasn't expecting to reread but they had it in a sale on audio books so I thought okay I'll reread this. I studied this at college and I read it feverishly in two days and didn't really like it that much so I thought maybe I'll like it more when I'm not studying it and the answer is no. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I tried. I tried. But I just think it's so unevenly paced. There are some really exciting parts but on the whole it's actually quite a lot of detail and repetitive things that don't need to be in there because you have different perspectives. You have Jonathan Harker's journal, and you have Mina's, and you have Dr. Seward, or however you say his name. Um, it can get quite repetitive. And Van Helsing as a character just talks in continuous paragraphs that go on for pages, and it's actually quite dull and it's quite frustrating with women characters because it's the men are kind of amazed by Mina, like, wow, Mina, you can understand the train timetable, you can type up Jonathan's journal, what's a woman, but the dangerous stuff, you stay home. There's literally a bit where they're going to go and do something and it's dangerous and Jonathan says in his journal, I'm really glad Mina's staying at home. Mina said, I'm glad I'm staying at home. And the doctor says, I'm glad Mina's staying at home. You think, okay, we get it. It's just, it's just a bit depressing. They're either really sexually charged like Lucy or uh, restricted <laughs> like me you know and there are bits where I just think it's kind of got into a plot hole like there's a bit with Jonathan where without trying to spoil it I don't know how he gets out of that situation it's never explained never and it makes no sense to me how he just gets out of that situation 
it just skipped ahead that somehow he got out and he was really traumatised but he escaped and you think okay but how? And there's, there's details like at the beginning with Jonathan in Transylvania saying I was really thirsty the night because I had paprika in the meal and I think wow I don't care I know you could say that's like a symbol of otherness and like foreignness and it ties into the whole thing of like empire but I really think it's just a dull detail that no one needed okay Bram Stoker so I'm, I'm over Dracula <coughs> essentially that was a mini rant you're welcome we're moving on to a book that I flippin loved this this is possibly my new favourite book of all time. I don't know if it's of all time because it's not quite finished, but it's Wives and Daughters by Elizabeth Gaskell. This is almost finished, you can see where it's going to go, and even though it's such a, such a shame that the last chapter or two hasn't been written, it follows an incredible cast of characters that are just so beautifully written. It's one of those books that's quietly brilliant, and it follows Molly Gibson, who has a father who's a doctor and has been motherless pretty much for all of her life. Um, her mother died when she was young and her father suddenly remarries and it's about her navigating that relationship and taking on a stepsister and all the drama and scandal that comes with her life and it's also about her friendship with a family that her father takes care of and it's just got the most amazing character Squire Hamley gets the Hamley family that she's friends with is the best character for Russian I really think so he, he's just so endearing and tender but then at the same time so gruff and masculine and I just loved him and I loved Molly and I cared far too much about his characters that don't exist but I didn't care. I'm not really aiming this very well I'm just gushing like yeah this is so good just it's really long but it's so worth it it's one, it's one of those books that I read over a quite a long time over a month or two, but I really liked reading it slowly, just reading like a couple of chapters a day, but sometimes sort of I've read lots a day, but it's just nice to take your time with books like this and really soak it up. She's one of those writers, I was talking to Katie from Books Things About This, how she, Gaskell was very good at um, showing, not telling, and implying with things of her writing, whereas George Eliot is very um, in-depth explanation, psychological examination kind of writer, so there's, there's a bit more of telling and not showing so much in, in Elliot so I think Gasp was easier to read than Elliot and she might be my favourite Victorian author I think she is so yay I'm so glad I read this one and what's next oh it's Gaskell again so these are four short stories by Gaskell I didn't love these they were I think I, they just weren't long enough for me like there were bits I really liked in them but they weren't particularly memorable and they're, they're much more overtly religious as well because obviously I know Gaskell's rector's wife and you definitely get the Christianity vibe like, through her, her writings but it's not so heavy handed and it really is not these it, it's, it kind of bashes you over the head with it at some points um, my favourite story was probably The Manchester Marriage which is the least religious funny enough um, about a woman who remarries because her sailor husband is lost and he returns oh what will they do it's it's just a, quite a fun but more i suppose slightly more melodramatic story but again there were some nice characters and she's written loads of short stories and i haven't heard of any of these being her best short stories so i definitely would want to read more by her and it was nice to read something that wasn't her novels so yes that was good and then oh this is not <laughs> this is this is a collection i like to say i i read Rose was shot by Amy Levy and um, Levy, whatever, and it, it's only like 200 pages, so I, I did not read all of this. But it is a really uh, lesser known novel, she's a lesser known author, she was only 27 when she committed suicide, so I feel like the romance shot shows that she had potential, but it was for me a three star read because it wasn't long enough and it didn't have the same kind of depth that I'm used to I guess um, there's a lot of dialogue and not always that much character development but it follows four sisters Gertrude, Phyllis, Fanny and Lucy Gertrude being the eldest I think Fanny's the youngest and um, they are impoverished after their parents die and it's them opening the photography studio to try and support themselves and I loved that I really liked it it wasn't 
all about marriage from the offset. They obviously that does play quite a big part in it because it's a Victorian novel. Um, but it's it's interesting because it's quite realistic in the sense that yes, they have business and that's really cool and they're you know pioneering in that way. But also it is a struggle and it isn't this unrealistic fairy tale of and they did so well and they got all this business immediately and they were fine. You know it does talk about their shabby dress and them being conscious of it but not wanting to go to like certain social engagements or being worried about that when they are within society because they know that they're shabbily dressed and that kind of thing but also being proud that they're supporting themselves so that was a really nice different woman's story that I haven't really seen so much because normally it's not sisters band together in the same way and it's they sort of just spare a little bit more whereas in this that you have the the real financial risk that they cannot make enough money but it's also still like a good person very woman and I just I enjoyed that but it, it also isn't the best story ever it, it's also like, quite rushed at the end I would say but I would definitely try to do more of her work I mean she hasn't got a huge body of work obviously and as some part of the novel I think it even shorter so I might find the same thing but I'm sure if she had lived longer and had time to develop her writing she could have written something really great so such a shame we're glad to have read that 100% and then the last physical book I have to talk about is this is, again I did not read all of this uh, the, a woman of no importance which is one of the group reads I didn't really read importance being earnest I loved this play it was I don't know if it's better than the important to be honest. I think it might be just because that one's done so much and I think it's such a shame that this play is neglected in being put on. It follows Miss, Mrs. Arbuthnot and her Albert's not, I don't know, however you say her name, and her son Gerald and she is the woman of no importance and it looks at the social shunning of her and her son because he's illegitimate and she had him out of wedlock and no one knows who the father is and I really liked it because at the beginning it just seems like a normal Oscar Wilde farce in Act 1 and Act 2 but then it gets a lot more serious and it really looks at the consequences emotionally and socially economically that have impacted Mr. Starbuck not and it's fascinating but it's it's really quite serious and it feels very feminist actually so I'm maybe really excited and the ending is brilliant, the last line is brilliant, I don't just want anything there's this can of a lord, Lord Illingworth, who is trying to give Gerald an, an occupation and an opportunity to better himself and it's, it's all about the clash between Mrs Arbuthnot and him and I really liked it and I would highly highly recommend it because it's still very readable as a play. I think plays aren't always readable, you need to see it to enjoy it but Oscar Wilde you can always read his wit. And then the other books to quickly want to talk about I read an audiobook or I had to go back and the first one is Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This is only his third published novel and I think it shows because it was a four star rather than a five star read for me. I really really enjoyed it but I don't think it has the same kind of finesse and depth as his later novels and it's about Nicholas Nickleby obviously who suddenly becomes the sole earner of the family when his father dies and they have no money from a poor investment so he has to support himself and his sister Kate and his mother and he and the family appeal to his rich but very miserly uncle Ralph who doesn't want to provide for his family and sends him to Wackford Squeeze the school in Yorkshire to work there and they found, find a very abusive situation where often disabled boys who are being essentially pushed away in the school by their parents are just being being paid for but actually Wackford Squeeze is taking the money for himself and the boys are very neglected educationally in terms of nourishment in terms of care all those things and he befriends a boy there called Smike who is the most endearing Dickens in character I think I've ever read I think that's that's really what makes this book so good I think if Smike wasn't in it it would, it would just be at least 20% less good than it is and it's about him saving Smike but also, but also about how he goes on from there to do lots of different occupations and support family really and it's obviously filled with love interest and that kind of thing but I, I enjoyed it because it's really entertaining it's 
quite episodic. It's a little bit like a bit paper papers, but better than that with insects you have these different adventures. It's not just set in London, it's set in Portsmouth, in his hometown, in Yorkshire. It has quite a melodramatic ending, which I really quite enjoyed reading, if I'm honest. And it's got like the typical Dickensian trait where you find out at the end the two characters are linked in some way. Shock, horror. Or maybe not horror. Maybe horror. Ooh. You can decide when you read it. I know Tom from Tom Reeses loves this book. And I haven't read all the Dickens novels, I saw a few to go. So I don't know how I would rank it. I find it hard to rank books. I don't know if you have that within an author. I, I quite often find it hard beyond that this is my favourite, second favourite. I, I can't really rank them so easily in preference. But anyway, moving on to a buddy read, which I read with KG from Books and Things, although I did not get going with so long. She'd finish it by the time I really started it. And that is The American Senator by Anthony Trollope, which is a much less known Trollope, but I loved it. Really great story. So it is about the kind of courtship behaviour of two women. So you have Mary, who's a kind of angelic, good example of woman, and then Arabella, who is a scheming woman, and it is pretty funny, actually. So Mary is... A woman who is in love with a squire who is a landowner and therefore above her social status so she feels like it's unattainable that they can be together whereas Arabella is in a situation where her parents are separated and her and her mother are just going around from house to house so she really has aspirations for a rich husband and she tentatively gets engaged to someone but then tries to entrap another lord into being engaged with her and it's really clever how it looks at marriage in quite a different way and then Throughout this, you have the American Senator Elias Gotobed, which is an incredible name, and he is kind of like a commentator on the whole situation and on the English ways. And it culminates in a lecture at the end that he gives on the eccentricities of Englishmen, and it's taken very badly. But it's a clever way of Trollope of using him as a vessel to kind of critique the English political system, the justice system, the church. So I, I, I don't know how that would have been received in Victorian times, people would have found that quite funny or powerful in some way or if they actually would have also been quite insulted up in arms about it, I'm not sure but it's also, oh, even though Arabella like, is the anti-heroine in the situation, it's also good at pointing out that women have this real need for stability and if her and her mother don't have a place that's permanent to live in or any kind of financial provision, then she does need to marry well actually. You know, she she or at least well enough that they could be supported consistently. So it it's a good balance I think and she's not completely demonised and you do have sympathy for her. I think she's slightly similar to Cynthia in Wives and Daughters in that way, in that you shouldn't like her in a lot of ways, but you just do. And and it's it's a good standalone trollop, I would say, if you're not into a series by him. And then the last one, whoa, I've been talking so quickly, I'm sorry guys, um, that I have to talk about is Free Men to Vote, or oh, I had to think there, uh, by Jerome K. Jerome, which I still feel like I said Hawley, but it's not, it was published in 1899, so just in there. And, that I didn't with the hand it was, sorry, sorry, let me just get myself rearranged, there we go. And it is a very gentle story about him and his two friends, George, is it George and William? I think so. <laughs> um, taking a boat trip down the Thames um, to Oxford, and it's, I don't want to say it's a bit of fluff, but it is pretty light and it was more of like a 3.5 story because I felt like it didn't have like that pizzazz of writing. It has some very funny episodes, but it is, it is, like, that is very episodic and there's a bit where they go to Hampton Court and they get lost in the mix and that's hilarious, but then there are also historical tangents that go on for a while, like about Magna Carta or Henry VIII. And that sort of brought it down a bit, it's a little bit uneven in that way, but really funny and I think it's a good classic if you're intimidated by classics because it's short and it's really accessible, especially for a Victorian book. I think a lot of people wouldn't know that, that is a Victorian book. So I think that's everything. Woohoo! I'm sorry I did not explain any of those books well at all 
and I know it's a bit weird that I have Christmas jumper on to about October, but oh well. I'm hoping next year I do better. But I'm I'm still pretty happy actually with what I read. And everything was at least a three star. Actually no, apart from Dracula. <laughs> Dracula was a two star read. If you love Dracula, try and convince me why it's good because I don't feel like that. Let me know what you read in Victober. I'd love to know if you have a wrap up, please post it below because I'm so behind on booktube, I'm so sorry. I just, I have no time at the moment because pantomime started at the theatre where I work so it, it's it's going to be crazy from here on in. But I would love to see it. Please do link it below or just tell me what you've read or if you'd like to read any of these now. And I will see you soon for Bookish Elegance. Bye!